here at the uh, at homes and uh, doing some plots and uh, kicking ideas around. And uh, I'm going to try to hit on uh, a few things that hopefully will be of some interest to us uh, over the next half hour. Uh, we'll start with the with the fertilizer plot. Uh, I will make a mention that my whole my whole website is goldcorn.net. Uh, I know most of you have that as your personal home page on your computer at home. If you haven't been there, the performance trials are up. They were up on Friday, uh, the uh, was that the 29th. So we'd like to get the performance trials up on the 25th of November. That's our goal. We didn't quite make it this year because we had some late harvest and some tough The Performance trials are up. I'm going to talk about them a little bit. There are also some other tools that you might find of interest uh, on uh, on the website. So one of the common questions that we've had over the last five years, and we're just finishing about five years of starter fertilizer uh, approaches, you might suggest, well, goodness, have we done starter fertilizers before? Have we done them to death, perhaps? And I was getting lots of questions about guys that wanted the planters to look like this, right? Uh, in fact, if you could get rid of that liquid tank on top, then you'd be happier. Uh, so we're trying to move away from, uh, from, from big starter fertilizer approaches uh, in, and contrast that to perhaps those that would put significant investment to bring in dry end or liquid with them. So we're trying to answer some of those questions. Uh, the other thing is I've still got about 15 years of my career, so I've got to keep doing something, right? So we're going to look at starter fertilizers again. Uh, you guys have heard some of this before. It'll be a, be a bit of an update today. Uh, this will be the last time that I talk about starter fertilizers for a little while. So that's what I plan there. We've got options of putting it uh, in furrow and dry, uh, in furrow and liquid, either wherever you want it. Uh, so here are the results from this past year. Uh, so this was a relatively low test K site. It's a 73. Uh, there are lots of 73 soil test Ks in the world or in the province. Um, it's a 26 for phosphorus. There are also lots of 26 relatively high soil test P. Uh, here are the uh, treatments that we laid down. This was uh, this was not planted too too early. I can't remember exactly the day. Uh, uh, Paul, do you remember what day we finally got this thing stuck in the ground? June 5th. Okay. So anyway, there's the control uh, at 123, and then we did six, uh, five gallons of 6.46, and uh, I got a nice bump out of that. Seasons pass is another liquid. I don't know what happened to it. Uh, then we look at some uh, some other uh, options, and you can see that things don't really change much for us. You know, whether we run this 10.24, uh, 6 sulfur, 0.6 zinc, or whether we run the 6.46 with 5, uh, 50 pounds of potash added to it, or some other more aggressive dry fertilizer blends, uh, this particular plot seemed to hit a plateau at about 135, and we, it would move. The back is not generally what we've been seeing over the last five years when you're talking about soil test of 73. In fact, if anything we've learned over the last five years of doing these starter fertilizer trials is that that really it should be the target of our concern when we start talking about P and K management. Areas in the fields or fields that have slipped down into this sub-80, sub-90 sort of range is, can cost us a fair bit of yield. We didn't see it in this particular field, but I'd like to show you the alarm data from this year, and interestingly enough, we have two strips in, or two blocks in the lower trial where we haven't been or did not broadcast uh, 200 pounds of potash, and a block where we did broadcast 200 pounds of potash. In this case, where we broadcast the potash, we're working at, funny enough, a 73 uh, ppm soil test K. And where we have not broadcast potash, it's down to a 46. So I think those are pretty low numbers. But if you look from this year's data, we see just huge responses to starter fertilizer or broadcast fertilizer at these soil test levels, particularly on the potash front. So right off the bat, here's no starter fertilizer where we did not broadcast 200 pounds of potash and where we did broadcast 200 pounds of potash. So what's that? 60 bushel response to dealing with these depressed um, K numbers. If you look at, we'll just go down this uh, no broadcast avenue here for a little bit. So this would be out of any, no broadcast phosphorus, no broadcast potash, just getting yield out of what the starter rates. 
So the next spot we started retreating is essentially the lip is in furrow. So there's 22018, and there's 6246. There's 6246 with 50 pounds of pot as brand inside it. And you can see what I meant by the Orangeville results here and my Aurora results don't don't jive too well because there's what 50 pounds of potash banded in the 2x2 ditch for us on these low testing sites. And then there's our season's pass. So one of the questions we've been asking ourselves, if you happen to have ground that's relatively low on soil test K, right, uh, can, you, can you get any advantage out of just running the liquid 6.24.6? Is, is there enough potash in 6.24.6 to do any good at all on these low K soils? Well, clearly the answer is yes. Almost scary yes. Go from a 68 to a 106 on a low testing K soil with a 22018. Now that's surprising. Heck, I've had this for five years now. The three pounds of K on these low testing soils can give you that sort of dramatic response. Now this is this is over the top even from what we normally get. But even 10 or 15 bushels, when all you did was put down uh, three pounds of K through a 6246. The other question we've had is, okay, so if a little bit of K in that 6246 is doing something for you, is, there any, is, is it worthwhile chasing something with uh, a 22018 type analysis? Well, this year it showed up six bushel. That's probably not uh, significant. Uh, and I think over the whole data set, the wins of 2.2018 over 6.246, even though we are putting down three times the amount of K, the wins for 2.2018 over 6.246 have been sort of marginal, right? Uh, then, of course, the other intriguing thing, we can look at this next block, and this next block is all dry fertilizer, and it's all either map-based or MES-based. So the, the uh, micro encapsulate, so it's kind of like a mat with sulfur and zinc in every uh, granule fertilizer. But in this block here, uh, zero potash, right? None of these analyses have any K. We've got all sorts of combinations, some with sulfur, some with zinc, some as a meds formulation, some split uh, so that a third of it goes down the, the furrow and two thirds of it goes down the two by two. Uh, some with 10 gallons of 28 spiked in on top of it, and some where we actually uh, doubled the rates or nearly doubled, so put down 300 pounds of 10.40. And you can see what those numbers are doing for us. Take home message there is what? If you haven't got the K thing sorted out, all the N and P and sulfur and zinc in the world doesn't get you very excited. Right? This block, we range from 72 to 109, so yeah, there's some improvement there, uh, but uh, not nearly where you need to be because you haven't managed the K problem. And if you drop down to this last group, so these are much better yields, 139, 147, 160, those are all dry fertilizer that have significant amounts of K in the starter. Now what you probably, of course, would, would prefer to do, unless it's the last year you're ever going to have this piece of ground, is you probably want to broadcast K to try to deal with this low testing soil. So all of these yields here now are with 200 pounds of 0060 broadcast, and you can see we go from a 107 average to a 158. And then the point that I guess we'd like to drive home is, now if you go down into this range here, right? So these are these starter fertilizers that are bringing N and P and zinc and sulfur in various combinations. Now if we go down in here where we're feeding it pretty heavily with N and P and sulfur and zinc, right? Now all of a sudden you've got yields of 186 or 182. And instead of 109, and that's because now you're working from a situation where you've met the K needs with broadcast A, and so these other products can actually do something for you. Try to throw out these products without having dealt with the K issue, and you're at 109. Throw them out there after having dealt with the K issue by broadcasting, and you get to a 182, uh, 186. Uh, so that, and, and that's the message from the Alora site for this year. 
But actually, it's the message from the whole five years of data, which, of course, we didn't expect. We thought we were going to, you know, fuss around with all sorts of different combinations, which we did. But in fussing around with combinations of MAP or MEZ or sulfur or zinc or inferro or liquid or dry, what ended up at the end of the day is that the only significant responses that we often got was when we stumbled in the fields that had slipped below 80 ppmk and there potash took over and pretty much ruled the roost. And if you didn't look after that, the other stuff was sort of insane. Okay, I'm prepared to take a question on uh, P or K or starter or sulfur or zinc or anything you look up there that we say, geez, I don't know, he's got some guy, he's got too many numbers on the slide. Any, any question? Time to get by that. Pardon me? Time to get by that. Is that all? Yeah, we've, we've, uh, we've played with that in both ends. And uh, on these relatively low tested soils where you can significantly see the potash effect, it hasn't really mattered whether we did fall or spring. Uh, we, we, could get, we could get significant uh, responses, and it didn't really matter much whether it was a fall K or a spring K. And so sometimes the guy says, oh, I didn't get it on last fall. I'm at a 75, but geez, I'm not going to waste it and put it out this spring. No, absolutely not. Broadcast this spring on the 75 soil test K, and it's the right thing to do. So uh, you're probably familiar with this for, uh, just for uh, a little bit of a, a tune-up. So this is the potash efficiency that we're looking at on some of these low testing soils. And by low, I essentially mean sort of 80 parts per million or less. And, uh, and you don't always see it, but it's this outside uh, browning of the leaf edges, right? So you have all this uh, browning along the edge of the leaf. That's uh, almost exclusively a potash effect. If it was a nitrogen problem, the tip of the leaf would be brown, but then the yellowing would run right down in the middle of the leaf. In potash, the edge browns, and the middle of the leaf actually stays uh, green. So, um, those essentially are our, uh, some of our key conclusions. Um, uh, there is surprisingly good response to K in starters. If you had, like I mentioned the other, a minute ago, that if it was land that was a low test K, but you didn't think you had control of the land <coughs> past next year, and they had dry fertilizer capabilities, could you get most of the yield out of that field, not broadcasting 200 pounds of potash, but putting 40 pounds down in the starter? And the answer is over the whole thing said, that, yeah, you can get a long way. If you don't feel that you can stomach spreading 200 pounds of potash so that your neighbor can use it next year, right? And you just want to get by a cheap state, uh, you can put down a fair bit of K in a starter band and get most of the yield out of that field without broadcasting the K. And I'm going to talk about the liquids. The liquids surprisingly do a fair bit for you, but as you've seen in the data, if you're expecting six gallons or five gallons of 644.6 to solve the problem, it's not going to do it. It does surprisingly quite a bit, but it won't do enough. Right? You're going to be short on these low testing fields, and you can't rely on just five gallons of 624.6 to solve, a, to solve a, a low K situation. And uh, yeah, I think we're good there. We don't really need to talk about the phosphorus. I did want to talk maybe a minute or two about nitrogen. Uh, so again, here's the calculator. This is what we hang our hat on in terms of trying to make good recommendations. You click on that button, it brings up a little spreadsheet. We've talked about that in previous meetings. I won't uh, bore you with uh, the details there, but here's, uh, here's something that I wanted to chat about. So this is Stuart's approach to managing nitrogen uh, more effectively across the province. That is, let's try to pull our androids back a little bit up front. Reduce that application up front to 100 pounds per acre plus whatever end you put in the starter. Then watch the weather and the yield potential, and then make a decision whether you're going to top up 50 pounds additional. I'm just using numbers. Those could be 80 and 30 or 125 and 50. But the idea of putting essentially two thirds of your nitrogen up front uh, with the starter, then uh, have a look at what the weather does to you, what the yield potential does to you, and then try to make a decision as to whether uh, you should top up that additional 50 pounds. 
My first premise here is that year-to-year -year variability is significant. And some years, this will give you all the nitrogen you need, walk away, and you're good. Other years, because of rainfall and temperature, you will absolutely need to come back in and top up with another 50 pounds. So that was the idea. So, never before seen in all other than meetings I've done this week prior to the uh, is the summary of that attempt to analyze that. So, here's the challenge, right? Here's the test. Starter, 100 pounds of pre plant in, plus 50 pounds of side hairs. So that's done in period. Put that up against starter, plus 100 pounds of pre plant, and don't go back in side dress at all. And by side dress, I can sit whenever you want to do side dress, right? We'll talk about that a little bit. But essentially, sort of a June 5th application. Here are the uh, 17 sites that we ran, 2011, 2012, 2013. So this is the advantage to coming back with your 50 pounds. 25 bushel. Oh, no, sorry. This is the starter. In case you want to know what the starter was on average on these sites. 25, 19, and 11 pounds of starter. Here is the advantage in bushels per acre to have you come back and put the additional 50 pounds down. 21 bushel and 11, 4 bushel and 12, 18 bushel and 13. Here's the profit increase for doing this versus this. $56 ahead in 11, $22 behind in 12, and $39 ahead in 13. So, I'll let you digest that data for a minute. This is contrasting putting that starter 100 plus 50 versus just putting down the starter plus 100 over three years. $56 improvement, lose $22, gain $39. So what do you think the conclusions are from that data set? We have a pencil ready. I'm happy to write it down. I haven't figured it out myself yet. Yeah. Bushel and a half, 
little over a bushel. So the numbers are pretty tight. Right? So these negative numbers essentially uh, mean, right, that, uh, that uh, well, let's not talk about I really get it. I really can't pull the numbers apart. Those are all those numbers are all so close that from a profit perspective, in this data set, whether you put it all down up front or whether you split it, didn't make much difference. So yeah. So when you got starter plus 50 on the side of it, so basically you put what like what does this like, happen? This is all about the week. Like profit. Yeah, good question. So to be clear. That when I say starter plus 150, right, on average across these sites, that meant there was 25 pounds of starter plus the 150 we put down. No, but it's all done right at the plant. And this would all be done at the plant. As opposed to June or whatever. Yeah, so this one would be starter and planting, 100 pounds of in done at planting, not through planting, but done at planting, and then 50 pounds of side dress. Say the 10th of June, right? Say the 10th of June would be a, a, a reasonable number for that side of this, right? So the total, the same amount of men, uh, uh, split two different ways, doesn't really change your profit potential that much. It, it, it just, it's just hasn't been a big deal, right? The advantage in terms of making some money is to try to identify the years or the fields where you don't need to be at that 150 pound. That's, I think that's what the data says, that, that if you could identify the years, the seasons, or maybe the fields within the season, where once you put down 100 pounds at home with the starter, you should say, hey, this is a year where I'm going to walk away and we're not going back out there and we'll save 25 bucks. Right? This is all 28. So uh, the entire data set, pauses to think whether he's about to lie or not. The entire data set is 28. And, and so our, our, we inject 28 right at planting time with the same rate that we come back and inject it as a, as a side dress unit. Or in some cases, it's 28 streamer nozzles uh, down on top. Right. Any other questions? So this whole idea of us, you sort of led me into that, I appreciate that. Uh, this idea of putting 28 down, so we've, we're trying to preach to this idea of easy on the nitrogen up front, make some decisions during the late April, May, early June, look at the weather, blah, 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 try to decide when you go back out there. Uh, for those of you who are completely uh, disinterested in, uh, in side dressing, that is the, the process of of driving up and down through your fields again and knifing it in, you might consider, well, what about just spraying it over the top? Uh, so get a big rake, 120 foot boom, streamer nozzles, we can make that 50 pounds top up look like a pretty uh, painless operation. And so we've been looking at, well, what are, the, what are the disadvantages of that? And so this trial focused on leaf burn, leaf injury, and so that's the four leaf stage, and essentially uh, there isn't much burn that stays around at the four leaf stage. If you're out there at the eight leaf stage, there's the burn from 28, three days after we apply the 28. And there's the burn six days, so it uh, heals up pretty darn quickly. There's nine days. And so the burn is you know, relatively insignificant. And if we look at four leaf application, so this is 150 pounds, so 180 pounds put down up front. Here's putting it on the soil below the canopy, and here's putting it on as streamer nozzles over the top of the canopy. Those yields are essentially all the same. What did surprise us a little bit, when we get out to eight and 10 leaf corn, putting it under the canopy, 191 versus 179, 185 versus 168, actually directing the 28 under the canopy, versus spreading it over top when you're doing it at the 8 to 10 leaf stage uh, did actually give us more yield. So, you think that's just from bird? Yeah, that's good. I think, there's a, I think there's a little bit of burn factor there, but I'm not convinced because I watched all those plots and the burn was, was not very significant, right? Uh, so I'm not sure that it's all burn. Perhaps the end loss is worse 
when you hit it off the leaves and bounce it around a little bit, as opposed to directly between the end of the family. We're going to have to look at that, but the data set is pretty solid. That at the forward leaf stage, it didn't seem to matter. And you get into bigger corn, throwing it over the top, it's, it's causing a symbiote loss. So, uh, so I think the idea of if your top up 50 has to be 28 to do it in a hurry, I think you can get away with that. Uh, but you've got to be careful to not get beyond five leaf corn to, to make it work. And then finally, uh, so we're at, of course, a uh, big risk of planting three million acres of soybeans next year and very little corn. <laughs> Horse farmers didn't want to have half of my paycheck signed over to a friend. <laughs> and so, uh, and so I, I, uh, I come from Peterborough. I commiserate. I understand where you guys are at where the odds for you guys to make mistakes and still make money growing corn at $4 a bushel is, uh, you know, that's, that's a tough scenario. You have to do everything right in this country, uh, this part of the province, uh, to make money at $4 corn. The guys in Oxford can screw up endlessly and still make money, right? And so I appreciate the fact that one of the biggest decisions you've got to make and we don't have time to chat about it today, but I, I, I challenge you. One of the biggest decisions you've got to make is the hybrid. Uh, you know, I like to talk about nitrogen and phosphorus and iron and blah, blah, blah. But clearly, one of the biggest decisions you've got to make is what are the hybrids you're going to grow next year? One of the hybrids you're going to grow. So if you go to the OCC trials on goporn.net, we presented the data in a bit of a graph. Right? And uh, I should start with this one. So this is just the 2013 data from Alma and Orangeville. So you have meal and moisture. So every spot that these hybrids sit, that's a combination of what they yielded versus what their moisture was. So obviously uh, there's a trend that we understand that as you get out of here, uh, some of the higher yielding plots may have higher moisture. And, uh, and so, take a careful look. Here's the, here's the intriguing thing that is, is always been going on, but it's really going on this year. There's the one year date. So there's the number of hybrids you have to pick from if you just have, if, you just, if you're willing to make a decision on one year date. Right? And there's the number of hybrids, at least from the OCC trial perspective, you have to pick from if you want two years to date. So the number just boom, drops off like crazy. So you can have some confidence that at least you've got two years of data, that these are high yielding hybrids that you've got at least two years of data from. Now are they going to be the winners? Or are there some hybrids? Are there some hybrids in here? These are, this is one year data, so some of the two years are obviously in there. But now, are there hybrids in there that are going to make you more money next year? that you've got to take a chance on, but you don't have two years of data to, to, uh, to make. That's, that's the big risk. That's to me where you can win and lose in this part of the province, is can you pick hybrids that have one year data on them, the new hotshot hybrids that might make you I really, I really think you should look carefully at, uh, at picking your hybrids from the two year data set. Some of your hybrids will have to come some of your new hybrids, some of the ones you test on 10 acres or 20 acres will be from the one year data set. But I would highly recommend you look at a uh, two year data set, add that to other data that you can gather up in the area and evaluate uh, how many changes you need to make from the order you made last week. On that, I'm out of time. I'm uh, glad I could be here today and thanks for your excellent uh, questions.